Uh, so this is going to be interesting. There's, there's a back story. So Henry was here last year, if you remember. He was sitting, I think, in the second row, and he was asking a lot of questions in every single uh, part of chat session. He wrote the first check in Phantom. Uh, and, uh, you know, it has been really incredible to get to know Jaime. He was the head of uh, Market. markets uh, at City, Security Market. Markets for Latin America. City. He had been 30 years at City. 30 years. <laughs> yes, and that, that, that time we met, uh, you were, I went to the City uh, office in Wall Street. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was it. Um, so now he's here, not as, well, not as an LP sitting here. Now he's an entrepreneur. So this was the first thing for me, like having an LP that becomes an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. So I uh, joined Fiado last June? July. July. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot like to say, like, I, 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 I remember uh, Didrik calls me Didrik and Silvia are co-founders of Piano. And Didrik calls me and says, uh, you know, we have, uh, Jaime wants to join full time. And I was like, no, no, he didn't understand. He wants to join the board. <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 he really wants to join Piano. And I'm like, oh, I need to talk to Jaime. <laughs> So I call Jaime, and Jaime confirms this, and I go like, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> like, you know, it's, uh, I mean, this is a startup pre launch pre everything, and uh, you know, are you having like a <laughs> crisis or, or something? And it's like, no, so you can share the rest of the story quite yet. Yeah, uh, let me start by what I was doing in the city. I, 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 I started as a, as a trader uh, for a foreign exchange, then I became a head trader for the whole uh, emerging markets exchange piece in, in the city uh, in New York. Um, after that, I became head of uh, markets uh, in Mexico, so I managed uh, the treasury uh, for Banamex uh, for seven years. And for the last 11 years, I was managing the whole markets operation for Latin America and Brazil Bank. Um, uh, that's uh, the whole, not only the trading piece, but also the sales piece, and most importantly, the treasury piece. The treasury piece, if you look at a bank, it's at the heart of the bank. So I manage the investment portfolios uh, for all the banks that we have across Latin America. And we have banks or city banks but not me anymore, but city has uh, uh, a presence in every single country in Latin America except Bolivia, uh, Cuba, and uh, Nicaragua. That's it. And the rest, they do have operations. So the one thing that I got to see from that chain, being in New York and uh, being exposed to the whole of Latin America, is the integration that uh, the U.S. economy has in Latin America. And I got to talk to everybody around Latin America. Every single bank, every single central banker, every single important uh, finance office in all these countries. And uh, for a lot of the flows uh, that take place uh, north to south are critical. Uh, and being in New York, the other thing that I saw was uh, the life piece of those flows. It's not only a number, which is huge, but it's represented by a lot of people who are a significant portion of the U.S. economy as well. And for the size of those flows and the importance of the value that they provide to the economy both in the U.S. and in Latin America, their presence is non-existent. I mean, they have zero legal representation and are mistreated in every single part of the process. And I thought back then, and this is like around five years ago, that Citibank was in a very good place to solve the issue. Why? Because we're obviously a huge bank in the US and we have a tremendously important presence in Latin America. And not only that, and I'd like to say that Citi has a good heart and it tries to do the right thing. 
And uh, so when, when I started proposing this uh, to the management of the company, it said, okay, let's, let's find a way so where we can provide a platform that helps uh, immigrants in the U.S. Uh, integrate their lives, the financial lives in the U.S. and integrate their families back in, in their country, respective countries as well. I mean, the, 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 the uh, positive uh, reaction inside the bank was, was large. I mean, the, the group with uh, at top management level was big. Despite that, after four years of trying to do it with the city, it was impossible. I mean, the anti worries of uh, regulatory concerns, uh, other considerations, etc., etc., uh, it, made it almost impossible uh, to develop the platform that we wanted to develop. And it was very frustrating. And at that same time, uh, and this was a year ago, uh, I came as an LP uh, to, uh, to last uh, year's summit, and uh, I came across what uh, Sylvia and they were presenting as FIAL, which is precisely providing a platform for immigrants in the US and their families back in Mexico. And the freshness of the approach that I saw there, which was like, look at the whole family uh, cycle and look at their life in the US and look at their life in Mexico and how to bring that and not only concentrate on how do you transfer the flows, but how do you integrate these people into the finance, into the economy. I, I, I thought that they, even though there were still a lot of questions about how to do it, the spirit of what they wanted to do was exactly, exactly what I was wanting to do from city. I know that from city it was impossible to do so, so that's when I, I, I decided that uh, I could add to what they were already doing and uh, ask them if they were interested in having me, and uh, they both said like, yes, absolutely. But not only that, but, uh, they said like, okay, so if you want to join, why do you come and manage the company? I, thought, uh, I, I found that extremely humbling, and uh, one of the decisions I said, I go, you know what, not only do they, they have the right idea, but uh, they have the right partners, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the chemistry was, uh, was good from the very start, and that's, that's how we started. So, going from, from a big corporation like City uh, to a startup, especially you know, pre launch, it's a massive change. So, what things have you loved about the startup? World and what have been the challenges? Well, the what's the I mean, one of the things I haven't seen is it's, uh, the, the business I was managing at City was uh, in, in terms of revenues was a uh, two point uh, in, uh, actually income. Uh, we were at uh, two billion dollars of income uh, for that specific part of the business. Uh, so uh, I had 5,000 people working for me, and uh, yeah. so you could say like, oh, big shot. But, uh, at, at that level of management, my input into the company was maybe I could tear it like 1% to one side or 1% to the other side. But that was about it. The rest, I mean, the bank does it itself. If there's a lot of momentum of where the bank is going, and that's the amount of or the importance of my decisions was really marginal to the direction that the bank ran. Uh, and whereas, when you're in a, in a small boat like what we are right now, the impact of the decisions you made were like, okay, you can turn the boat around 300 or 180 degrees without, uh, without, uh, without in, in a blink. And I find that exhilarating. Like every decision that you make is impactful. Now, on the other side, I mean, it's, you're completely on contact, right? When you're making a decision in the bank, you have thousands of people that are responsible, you have the best legal advice, you have all the capital in the world, and it's very easy to make decisions under those circumstances. Once you're in a, as a founder, I mean, the first thing I found is that you don't have a <laughs> Uh, you have a uh, very limited advice, and uh, with every decision you make, I mean, you can even die it. So that, that is it's also, it, and it comes, it's impossible to the negative, but it's the same side. It's, it's two sides of the same. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I find it fascinating. Like, I think it's probably the most drastic uh, transition you know, from 
it's not only the revenue and, and, and the size of it, the size of the organization was a 30 year career uh, and then jumped into the other uh, extreme which I started with just like trying to become a company figuring out the business model so um, how is the other different like I remember even from from 2014, I've been saying like um, remittances and startups, uh, you know, all over again, and most of them focusing how they can make it cheaper and, and uh, you know, digi making it digital, you know, without, you know, that's kind of like the main, but nothing like massive, uh, drastic innovation. So, what is the other different? I think that uh, one of the biggest uh, things is that, and, and, and just to help the audience understand uh, what fiat is, right? It's um, the, when you look at, when you talk about remittances, uh, and, and let me just give uh, some, some numbers. But we all know, it's a super public, that there's a $60 billion flow of uh, dollars from Mexicans uh, into Mexico. There's another $50 billion that go to the rest of Latin America, mostly Central America and North of South America. So there's a total of $110 billion that, uh, that uh, Latin Americans send back to their respective countries. That's the number that everybody watches, right? And there's a whole industry around that. And uh, the, the, the purpose of the industry has, has been on uh, trying to, to get the best share of that flow. Uh, the way it's done right now is it's expensive uh, for, or it's, 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 it's very fragmented uh, flow uh, on how it's uh, electronified or uh, put into channels and then transmitted and downloaded back in, in, in their respective countries. But uh, what's, what people fail to look at is that the value of those flows, and this is, this is one question that we were talking about today at Notch Show. Um, and let's look only at uh, the, the piece that, uh, that, that, that corresponds to Mexico. Those $60 billion, uh, that's the amount of money that first generation Mexicans living in the US, both legal and illegal, send back to Mexico. That's around 12 million people. Uh, the average ticket of what they send every month is around 300. Fifty to four hundred dollars. That's what they send back to Mexico monthly. Um, what? And remember, this is they send it via remittances. Most of them, half of them, actually uh, do not have a bank account in the U.S. And they don't have a bank account in Mexico, so they have to use the remittance process using Western Union or uh, other similar companies, uh, where they have to they go with a check, they cash their check. They get charged for cash the check, then they have to send the remittance, they get charged for that, and again, there's always a commission that they pay there, then uh, their family here receives that check in a convenience store because they don't have a bank account, but they have to pay another fee there, and then they finally spend their money in cash again. So they spend cash here, and they spend cash, so they spend cash in Mexico, and they also spend cash here. So the immigrant that's living here is living in cash because they don't have a bank And what happens when you live in cash in a society like the American society, where every, everything is credit and everything is internet? These people are basically marginalized. And they don't have credit, they don't have access to credit, and they don't have access to internet. Things that everyone, every one of us take for granted. So that's when you start thinking, okay, what happens when you give uh, all of these people a bank account? The first thing that happens is that you open up the, 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 the total value of the wages that they generate. And this is important also. When they send $400 to Mexico per month, they send around 20% of the total value of the wages that they generate. So 80% they spend it. And they spend in cash. So if we're talking about $60 billion of money being transferred to Mexico, there's another $240 billion that get spent here in cash, in the U.S. And in the end, that's what we're going for. What we're trying to do is build a platform for them to give them access to financial services in the U.S. And we're also building a platform in Mexico that connects seamlessly to the platform that they have in the U.S. So that they can provide a way for their families to spend the money they make 
They spend in Mexico the money they make in the US. And we are trying to do it seamlessly so there is no cost. So we reduce the friction. So in the end, what we're looking at is to monetize or to, to uh, bring the whole amount of money that they generate into the economy. And nobody has been that, that way. So everybody's focused on the $60 million, but we're saying, like, you know, forget about the $60 million. Look at the value that they generate and try to bring all of that. Look at them as, as, a, as a whole ecosystem that crosses the world. So people here think, okay, let's buy this or that group because they generate value here and they spend the money here. But these people generate the value here and they spend it in Mexico. How is that different to other groups that generate value in one place and spend it in the same place? And that's where we consider ourselves to be different. Uh, because we are providing a better service by extracting value of the whole chain and not only part of the chain. Because everyone is leveraging only on the transfer that goes from the US to Mexico. When you think about the whole ecosystem, then you're able to provide much more value because you're looking at the whole uh, the, 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 uh, the, the whole wallet, not just the piece of the wallet. Plus, your approach has been focused on the problem of these families, not so much on the product that has addressed part of the problems from a very long time. Right, I mean, we haven't we have focused on the, on the product at all. We're trying to address the issue, right, which is how do you help to, uh, to come into uh, to be valued? Uh, how do you help uh, the illegal immigrants in the US to open their first bank account? be able to save, to be able to use their money much more efficiently, uh, to be able to help their family participate in what they're generating. Right? And, uh, and that's not easy. That has been the most difficult piece, which is how do you have an immigrant here that uh, an immigrant, immigrant uh, opened their first bank account? And uh, we have been able to accept uh, many conversations we now have uh, we, we're now able to open uh, help them open bank accounts of only their Mexican documents. So they come here with their email or their passport uh, and uh, we're able to open it's a limited bank account. It's not like any bank account that uh, you guys open or everybody in this room has. It's a limited bank account but guess what? It's an FDIC issued bank account. I mean it's limited to ten thousand dollars. You can say up to ten thousand dollars but for 90% of our clients, this is more than enough. And it helps them to get on their way to then start saving and open their next bank account. So for them, it's like their first experience with a financial industry that has usually shown them. In this case, what we're doing is that we're opening a bank account that actually helps them, likes them, invites them to learn about how to save, about how to spend, about how to use a debit card, about how to use a credit card. But uh, the advantages that they have now that they are part of the financial system. So we're starting obviously with debit and credit cards, but the next obvious step is how you buy them, how you provide opportunities for credit, how do they start to pay a credit system. None of them get any leverage. So the $60 billion that they produce is a couple that they pay every year against absolutely no credit. So if you think that where the rest of the economy is, where credit represents a humongous piece of the coupons that all of you generate every year through your own wages. But this is what they have absolutely zero access to. And this is one of the things that once you bring all of that portion of the economy into, into the financial system, you can create tremendous wealth for them and their families. Can, can you share a story of uh, one of Yanko's customers? Uh, we, I, I'd say that I mean, when, when the, uh, we have this, this, this guy who came and across, we had the opening event in 14, right? And uh, I was talking to, uh, to uh, this Mexican, uh, had two months in the, in the US, uh, his wife was there, uh, his two-year-old daughter was there, and their three-month-old uh, son was also there. And it's three months, so three weeks, three weeks after. And uh, he, was, he was, came to the event and he said, like, are you guys really going to provide me with a bank account? He said, like, yes, absolutely. We're going to provide me with a bank account. He said, like, you know that uh, I, uh, I, I was, I came across the water because we, you know, the opportunities were much uh, better here. 
And I had this job, uh, which was very good for the beginning. It was getting accelerated there, but uh, they had to fire me because I had no bank accounts, so they couldn't possibly go to me. So now I'm working somewhere else where I'm making much less money, uh, but uh, because they're only, they, they can pay me cash. If I have a bank account in the US, then it opens all the opportunities for me uh, to get a different kind of job uh, that provides provides me with access to something that I don't have. Right? When we see those, and, and it was while they were saying, like, we love what you guys are doing, and it was there, they said, absolutely, please send me my car. And so these are, these are the kind of things that, that you hear firsthand, the, uh, the, the value that we create. And, and he was saying, if you do this for me, I'll, I have tons of friends around me in exactly the same situation. So they cannot open a bank account in Bank of America? They cannot. They cannot. It's easy. They cannot. You need a social security number, you need a tax ID number, you need uh, a documentation which is not available to many of uh, many. So how much time do we have? Uh, Six minutes for questions. Oh, for questions. Okay, so maybe we should open up for questions. Then two questions I have. The first one is why Mexico is one of the, the most unbanked countries in Latin America. Not like I don't know if there is like a similar some example with electric vehicles. The, we don't have a lot of electric vehicles because we don't have the, the distribution as an example of gas stations. We don't have charging stations. Not, I don't know if there is like a similar like that of why we don't have access to bank first. And the second, do you have like a numeric impact of what happens when a family has access to bank? I don't know if they increase like 50% their economy like with credit, etc. Good question. I mean, why is, uh, and, and, and I'm sure that a lot of people in the room know these numbers, but uh, in Mexico it's uh, bank population in Mexico is around 60%, so 40% population in Mexico is compact. And uh, when you start looking at the demographics of that population, is that 40% of the population is 100% of our clients. It's 100% of our clients. Which is, they, uh, the, the, the access they have to uh, a, this is, this is a question that, that I mean, being in, in Banamex and the uh, and same thing for BBVA, and these are large banks in Mexico that have tried, tried, and made significant effort to bank that population. And it's very difficult to bank that population. Uh, because a lot of them do live. Where do you think that $60 billion of, uh, of flows that come from the US into Mexico go to? Most of them go to this population. And they come in cash. They don't come to the banks. They, because banks here do not open an, an account for them. Uh, and uh, so, living in cash, they are not, they do not like to open a bank account. They live in cash and they, they are very, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, reticent to, uh, to open the, uh, to open the, the uh, uh, open bank account. Even for the banks, it's very difficult to bank this population. Very difficult to get to them. Because they already live in cash and they have absolutely no incentive to, uh, to actually find the money. Um, what we're trying to do is that we're not trying to convince the population here to open a bank account. But we are doing it through a different way. Right? We're banking the source. We're providing the first bank account to the people in the US where they do need a bank. And then we're asking, okay, use the bank account you have in the US to, now that your money is already electronic, don't break it down to cash. Make it so that your family in Mexico opens their first financial experience, because we're not a bank account in Mexico, but we are, we are a financial account. So that they learn how to use a bank account, and then they can't go into a bank, or they feel money, they, 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 they get uh, closer to the financial experience to open their first bank account. How much benefit does that bring in terms of, uh, I don't know, uh, but 
that then it would it, it's definitely an interesting moment, something that we should try to figure out. Once that once they are in the bank account, how, uh, once they are in the financial system, how much better they li their life becomes. I don't have a number, but I can tell you the first thing you have is you have access to credit. So the first thing you have is that in terms of uh, when you do not have a bank account, you live on the cash you have. And if you have an accident, there's, it's impossible uh, to mitigate volatility in the events that, were, that, that happen in your life. So accidents are very difficult to go through when you do not have the ability to, uh, to, to mitigate those. Education is something that you have to pay for both pay a coupon at the beginning and then you pay for your whole life uh, or you pay later. So a lot, of, a lot of things that, that, that are based on credit, on the ability to mitigate significant uh, impacts in cash, you lose if you don't have access to the financial account. So a lot of these things I'm telling you, I'm sure that, that we, could, we could talk about a specific number, but I don't have a number. I mean, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think it's amazing. You put it in such a clear way that the social impact, you know, combined with the strategic uh, business model is, is, is compelling. It's just absolutely wonderful, so congratulations for that. And my question is really, uh, uh, what about uh, when or how, you know, do you see all this, I wish you mentioned credit, debit, et cetera, what about mortgage? You know, the whole, you know, I come from a real estate background and banking this population, these immigrants, do you, do you see a path to you know the entire mortgage you know real estate platform for them as well in the US, 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 US and so forth? Well, that's that's very interesting. I mean, obviously not for not right now, but in the future, what happens is that there's tremendous value. And if you're in real estate and uh, and you're in real estate in the US, but you know about Mexico, and uh, so you look. I mean, what we're living through in Mexico right now, when this is appreciating, is not the normal trend. Usually, Latin American currencies as a whole tend to devalue the value of the dollar. So when you think about uh, real estate, the first thing to think about is that imagine that you have an asset in uh, you buy a house in Mexico and you pay with your salary in the US. Uh, the, the coupon that, or the interest rate that you can provide uh, for that investment is a very compelling interest rate. Why? Because the value of the inflow in terms of dollars, which is the value of the asset that you have, which is pesos, is, is, is something that you say that, okay, if this guy is going to pay for his house or her house in the next 20 years, what's the probability that the amount of pesos that that person owes me in 10 years, when expressed in dollars, is going to be much less dollars than the amount of dollars that uh, that represents today? Very high. So in terms of interest rates, you can provide a very low, a very interesting group, much better than what you can provide uh, through a mortgage for example. So that's one consideration. The other consideration is that you, you connect something that today does not exist, which is that this individual generates value in the US, and they're receiving a salary in the US, and nobody is recognizing that in Mexico. When they think about, well, I'll give you a, 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 I'll give you a mortgage, uh, where, uh, where do you generate uh, your money? Well, you know what? Uh, I, I, I work in the U.S. Oh, but that's not a permanent job. You can uh, you get extradited, uh, whatever. I mean, that's it. Like when you look at the specific individual cases, there is a volatility. But when you look at the total uh, population, you know that there's a large population that will live in the U.S. and will pay in Mexico. And when you look at the whole value of that portfolio, that's something that is super valuable and something that we should be looking. At. Once you open the channel for being able to spend in Mexico and uh, pay in the US, there's many opportunities. Real estate is one of them. There are many others. Yeah. 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 Why Fiat does not use or does not operate with cryptocurrency decentralized? Is that a threat or what? No, it's not a threat. It's not a threat. And, and, and uh, the, the reason is, there's no, I mean, when you look at, when you think crypto, you think you're, you're thinking about how you cross the border. So you, uh, so basically you're talking about taking fiat, which is dollars, converting it into crypto again, 
and uh, then uh, converting that crypto down to uh, pesos again because remember that this all of these individuals they don't spend crypto they don't say so they have to spend they have to spend dollars and they have to spend pesos so you have to find a way to actually cross the border and uh, crypto is a way again to focus on the specific transaction of crossing the border and that's not where we're focused we're focused on the creating the, the wallet in the US and creating a wallet in Mexico. The actual process of transferring value from the US to Mexico, we do it much more efficiently uh, without having to, to jump into crypto. We actually do it like in bulk instead of having P2P or transfer to transfer from this person in the US to transfer to Mexico. We open the whole channel so that we do it in bulk. So we could use crypto as a way to transfer. Uh, but the, the most important piece of the model is not necessarily the transfer, but the actual uh, dollar and peso wallet. So I don't that answers the question. Not very much, but uh, what do you think about CBDCs? I think that's a huge. Uh, I, I think that when uh, central banks are convinced that they can digitize uh, their currencies uh, using blockchain, I think any other crypto will find it difficult to explain. But, uh, but then again, I'm 56 years old and uh, that probably has been biased to, uh, to, to a certain part of the uh, information system rather than the, the, the more the more. How are we with that system? Um, by listening to you, I was remembering the talk we had earlier about unconscious bias. Uh, I'm wondering if the challenge that you face is more like a conscious bias of the population that you are trying to serve, or is the challenge on the other side, the administrative or legal? What is the challenge? Both. It's a good question because it's both. I mean, the legal and administrative uh, challenges that we have are based on the bias. I mean, when I touch it, again, I go back to that example, right? I mean, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to bank these clients because there is a bias within the bank to think that they are much more uh, risk, uh, risky clients because uh, a migratory status. Uh, uh, difficult uh, difficulty in, in uh, banking and so there is this bias that uh, this population is riskier and it's not once you start looking at the population it's uh, it's 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 it's, it's a big segment of the population that is tremendously risk averse uh, that uh, they uh, they the, the, it's very easy to determine where their money comes from. It's a population that generates a lot of small tickets. Instead of having large, okay, six million dollars doesn't come like a chunks, a big chunks of hundreds of thousands of dollars that could be very difficult to explain. No, this is people making a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars per month. You know where they make it, you know where they spend it, you know how they spend it, you can actually forecast the probability that they're going to make the same amount of money next month. And when you start thinking about it, it's very easy to take the risk away. But there is a bias to begin, beginning to think that it's a very risky population. So that bias is what turns it from a legal and regulatory perspective into something that's difficult to manage. Okay, thank you for your time. Uh, that concludes Jaime and Consuelo's chat.